So. When, when our, our next guest is, it's like E.F. Hutton when he says stuff. You got to listen. You listen. Yeah, absolutely. Let's bring him in. Our guest tonight's been the athletic director at BYU for 17 seasons. He's marched the Cougars through the Mountain West Conference, 12 years of independence, and is taking BYU into its first year as a member of the Big 12. He's an amazing story. We're thrilled to have Tom Homo on the Wise Guys tonight. I know everyone's looking forward to, to what we're about to do. Thanks for being here. It's good to be with you guys. You know, it's, it's, it's not often we get to hang out like this. So we were, we were excited. We worked a long time to, to, um, to get the favored spot in your schedule. And we, were, we think it's so cool that, uh, that you're going to be here. We're going to talk about a lot of things. And we want to start with uh, one of the biggest questions that we, we came up with. You have four Super Bowl rings uh, in your time with the 49ers. Most Super Bowl rings of any player in BYU history. If the band Journey called you and said, Tom... We would like you to be our lead singer for next summer, but it's going to cost you two rings. Would you give them up? No way. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, the, Come on, that's your band. It's funny you say Journey, but I, I've been on stage with Journey before. I know, so I we know do this. It, again. it doesn't matter. <laughs> so you went out there, would you just sing with them? No, no. But, that's, it, they but it's, we're, Tom, we're talking for a whole tour. You get to tour a whole summer with them. No, that's, that's all. That's all. Don't um, we all want to be rock stars <laughs> in the in See, the end? Here, this is no, what we no. can. This is what we can do on this show. We can do <laughs> fantasy stuff. Like it doesn't have. To, you don't even have to be a good singer. Now my band in San Francisco was Huey Lewis and the News. Yeah, Nets. really. Yeah. yeah. So and Journey was awesome, and they were great at inviting us to come around and be around, and they they let us come up on the stage, and, and it's just kind of one story. We're at, at the Oakland Alameda Coliseum. Yeah. Is where they where I saw them this one time. And uh, we were there, and we were backstage before the concert, just, just you know, shooting the breeze. Well, this is when you were guys. playing, right? This is when I was playing. Yeah. And, and this it, is when they were filling stadiums, not named Stadium of Fire, just stadiums because no, they're uh, playing. Yeah, big time. The Steve Perry and company. Yeah. Yes. And um, so we're getting ready. This concert's getting ready. You can see people are flurrying around. And I don't know if it was Steve Perry or somebody says, you guys want to come out on stage for the opening song? And I'm like, <laughs> so they they have these little flashlights and it, when you when the flashlights come out and people start shuffling around the crowd starts going crazy and you know by this time i'd played in some pretty big games and yeah. pretty big stadiums and it, it, they, they didn't really affect me too much my heart was beating a hundred miles an hour <laughs> really and the crowd was going crazy do you know what song they open with uh, i can't remember i can't remember anything <laughs> just the this. feeling though you can so remember the we're feeling up there and then Steve Perry gets on the mic when the lights came up, and there were maybe eight or ten of us up there. Yeah. And he gets on the mic and goes, hey, I want to introduce you to some of my friends and some of your friends. Some San Francisco 49 <laughs> The place went crazy. <laughs> and I was frozen like a deer in headlights. I didn't know what to do. And then they just kind of had to go, okay, get off. <laughs> <laughs> you guys beat it? Do, do, you have, do you have a favorite Journey song? Um. Lights go down in the city. Yeah, city. That's yeah. our city. Yeah. That is. That's your city. So, so Huey, what's your favorite Huey Lewis song though? Oh man, I, it's a hard. There's so many there's good so ones. So many right? to pick, but I can't pick one right now. I, I always sing the song. Do you remember the one? Um, yes, it's true. I'm so happy to be stuck with you. Yeah, so I always one. tell Brenda that's our song because she's stuck with me. So one of Huey's songs is "Hip to Be Square." Oh right? yeah, and, yeah. And he had a couple of 49ers are singing background on that. So my roommate with the Niners, Ricky Ellison, well, for the whole time we were together, um, he knew Huey really well, and they were tight. I don't know, they golfed together. <laughs> Huey's a big time golfer. Yeah, he golfed oh, yeah. a lot. And uh, we go into Ricky's house, and there's a gold record on his wall, on Ricky's wall, because he was- He was on the he track. He was on the track. Yeah. That said, stuck, happy to be stuck with you. That's so Jack, who you met, one of, our white, one of the wise guys, he, he used to have a restaurant in San Francisco. And uh, he tells the story one night, uh, in comes this guy by himself, and he says, hey, I've heard good things about this place, and so I would like to eat here. And so he goes and he sits down and he does his thing, and, and then Jax is, comes over to his table, and, and he's like going, you know, you look a lot like Steve Perry. And he goes, well, I am Steve Perry. <laughs> and, uh, and they were in town because they were playing like the next night. And he had his nice dinner. And Jack said he was super cool and nice. And he ate and left a nice tip and got up and was out his way. And, and that was Jack's brush with, with fame. Because back then, I'm amazed that he was doing anything by himself because the band was off the charts. You know, what's one of my favorite things about the city of San Francisco, it's a big city. But back in those days, 
you could go into the city and you'd see celebrities and you'd see stars and and people didn't really get all um, you know what's the call when you're taking pictures? Oh, and like paparazzi, paparazzi coming after you him. Know, yeah, you know it wasn't like that, and people were cool. And if they saw you, they just go, "Hey, good game the other day." You know, it just was so fun. That city loved their teams, the Giants. Oh, it was one of the great the sports Niners. towns yeah. in in the in the world yeah. that during that run when you guys were so yeah. good back in those days. And to be able to, Lori and I, you know, we lived down on the peninsula, a little oh, more quiet. Yeah, yeah. but um, we would go up into the city. And I, we just loved it. We had our little small Italian restaurants <laughs> on the you might have eaten North, the Jacks. North Beach that yeah. were packed away, and I just it's, it brings back tremendous memories. When when you were at Stadium of Fire here last month, uh, and Journey's the band, and the place is packed, and they start singing lights, and everyone's got their phones going. Did you tear up? No, but it was very memorable. Yeah. Uh, just it just it was a long time ago. Yeah, but it's just amazing that. Some of the me original members of the band are still up there playing, and they're grinding. They're yeah. still hitting it pretty good. <laughs> and the part I love about that is, like, athletes, they just wear out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. After 10 or 12 years, that's a long career, except for Tom Brady. Right. Tom can play forever. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, these musicians, they're so skilled. They're so great. They, it's in their mind. They're so creative, and they love the gigs so much that just the beat to be able to get up on those stage. It's addicting. It's hypnotic, and they just. It's hard for them to break away. But why would they? Right. Yeah, people, if they can do it, they can do it for a long time. We went to the Eagles when they came here. Uh, to it's, hey, we can call it the Delta Center again, right? Yeah, yeah. Back to is. the old day. So they came to the Delta Center. Brendan and I went, and Joe Walsh is up there just shredding, and I'm like, is he like a hundred? Like, I don't know how old he is, but he was still ridiculously good. Yeah. So I know those great bands. We, Dave and I were talking. We're like, okay, so Journey filled up that stadium on the on the fourth. And what we were nostalgic about was, okay, here's the stadium's full. Next time the stadium's going to be full, that's what we were thinking, yeah. is going to be for the opener on September 2nd against Sam Houston. Um, what What's your message to Cougar Nation as we march forward into this Big 12 and, uh, and, and what do we need out of them as, as we embark on this journey? I, I think the message I'd say is be you, be BYU. I mean, the, we've, we've done it our way forever. And I don't think we're going to be successful doing it any other way than the way <laughs> it's done and has been done in the past. You mentioned so many of those names of some of the guests you've had in here, and they're unique. And we, you know, from the time of... Lavelle and even previous coaches, even some of the other sports you talked about, Dave earlier, Dave Rose. Um, each one of them had their own uniqueness, but it fit within the brand of BYU Cougar sports. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we just keep going. Now we're internally, we're going to have to learn and grow and change and transition a little bit, but our core principles have, have got to stay the same. Neil is with us from Tucson, Arizona. Garrett's here from Signal Mountain, Tennessee. Nice. Uh, it, this live stream thing is a racket because people can get on and chime in from all over the world about the, uh, what they love about Co the Cougs. Corey Yoshimura. I think Corey is our is from the first because he comes in from Tokyo most weeks, um, but because that's further than Panama, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Singapore. Yeah, we've had we had Singapore. Australia a couple yeah, weeks Australia ago. Australia was in. Australia might take it too. That's yeah. just, it's pretty cool, and that. That's an indication when we do this show, because it's a global podcast, it's really neat for us to think about the reach of BYU and BYU sports, because this is a sports theme show, that, that there's, there's truly fans from South Korea to, to Japan to Australia. Is there any other brand like it in, in college sports right now? No, I don't think so. I, I think that our affiliation with the worldwide church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, People come from all over the world to B BYU, and then they just don't stay in the Wasatch Front. They yeah. go all over the world, sometimes back to their homes and sometimes to new places. They go to graduate school, then they get jobs, and then they come in, BYU, this is the place. Yes. But then they spread around throughout the world. And I just think the uniqueness of the affiliation, Notre Dame would be somewhat similar, but it's not like the Mecca for the Catholic Church. But I think you know BYU being here in Provo and the Salt Lake Temple and church headquarters in Salt Lake, yeah. Utah is the spot. Well, you were saying that the the sign in the entry as you go right by practice fields, enter to serve, go or enter to learn, go forth to serve, just popped into my head. That really 
that model applies. That's exactly what you're talking about. They come in to learn, and then they go all over the world to serve. It's, it's so real, and I drive by it every single day. Yeah. I look at it every day. I think it's kind of a tradition. I wouldn't say superstition. <laughs> it's a tradition, and I, I, it means so much to me. It's, what, like, it's why you asked. Where they're, they're everywhere. How's yeah. that work? And they do serve. But one of the other things they do is they remain loyal to mm -hmm. BYU. And part of BYU is the sports, the athletic teams. And I love that. There's the other, you know, obviously, if you looked at uh, Vocal Point and some of the other right. musical groups, uh, the Young Ambassadors, that, the brand that tr we go all over the world. You, you mentioned that this week we got our men's and women's basketball team in um, Croatia and Italy. I was with the women's volleyball team this yeah. year in Cairo, Egypt, Istanbul, Turkey, and in Athens, Greece. Wow. And just you, seeing the teams and going over there and seeing these young women that are six foot three. <laughs> they, st they stood out over there, strong, didn't they? You know, powerful, beautiful women. And they play hard and they're very athletic. But just the presence and to see the conversations that they have in Egypt. We played the, na the Egyptian national team. They were all Muslim. We were all members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yeah. You're playing on the same court. It was a battle royal. They beat us. They were very good. Afterwards, you're going to have a dinner. They don't speak. There's one girl on their team that played in the States. That knows English. That knew English. The rest of them didn't. Mm. So after the dinner, during dinner, they're, kind of, they're sitting across from each other on a table. The coaches and I were on the, another table. You look over at them. They're kind of ice breaking because they have something in common. It's this volleyball. It's a w sport. And then they have other things in common. They're just, they're girls. They have, you know, friends and boyfriends. And by the end of the night, they're talking. I don't know what they're saying because they don't speak each other's language. <laughs> but by when we left that night, they were taking selfies and pictures and hugging, kissing on the cheek. That's and it was like, what an amazing opportunity for our young women when they're 18 to 22 years old, to go across the world. That's yeah. what enter to learn, mm -hmm. go forth to service. Yep. BYU Athletic Director Tom Homo is on The Wise Guys tonight. We're live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and wiseguys.com. We're going to go back in time here a little bit. Uh, think of the men you've played for. Lavelle Edwards, Bill Walsh, George Seifert, also the same men that you coached for as a grad assistant, defensive back coach. You also worked for Steve Mariucci. Why do you think these men were placed in your path? Oh, man. It's really hard to put it. I think about it a lot because I'd even, even go back further. I had two of my favorite coaches of all time were my high school basketball coach, Ed Gorgian, who just died this year at 90. 90. Oh, wow. yeah. and, and a Ken Bierman, who was my defensive coordinator and DV coach. That These two men taught me so much about the not just the game but just about how to survive yeah. how to how to uh, carry yourself how to be a great teammate how to serve they taught me that then i when you count coach walsh coach seaford and coach edwards i count these two ken beerman and um, ed gorgian in that same thing and I, I here's what i think i think we all have incredible coaches or people um, mentors in our lives and I just don't think you get the most out of them and I, I was super fortunate to have some guys that yeah. are at the top of the pecking Hall order. of Famers. But I, I think that I've run into so many people in my life that also had influence on me in some way shape or form and I think that my mom and dad taught me early on it's not about you it's about what you can learn from other people. So the more friendly, the more helpful you can be to other people, you're going to pick up things from them. My dad was a barber. He yeah. worked in the same barber shop for 53 years. And you know what it's like? A barber is like a bartender. Yeah. You know, people come in there and they're going to tell you stories. <laughs> and, you know, like when I grew up, they didn't call me Tom Homo. I was Ivan's boy. That's yes. I thought my name was Ivan's boy. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you're Ivan's boy. And, and my dad was just a legend as a barber. Yeah. Think about that. And it wasn't like Floyd on... <laughs> Who was Andy another Gerber. legend. Yeah. Another Andy legend, Andy Floyd Gerber. on yeah. Andy Gerber. Andy Gerber. Show. Oh, yeah. But um, I think like watching my dad 
and all these people that he knew, and he'd come home and share these amazing stories every night at the dinner table. And so, like, I think that I was placed for a reason. I'll, I'll someday ask why that was. Yeah. But I, I think one of the things is, the best part about it is I picked some stuff up. I might not have picked it all up because I've had some failures after, post working with them that I should have known better. But there's a bunch of stuff that have helped, really helped me. You, you and I That's both had, had the chance to, um, to play for Lavelle. You got to coach with Lavelle. Um, I feel like I got closer to Lavelle when I was done playing, you know, covering him uh, from a broadcast perspective for all of those years. We, we got really close with he and Patty. In fact, Brenda's still really close with Patty to, to this day. Um, do, do you have a favorite Lavelle story? Oh, man. I, I There's so many great ones, right? But yeah. what, do, do you have a favorite that you would share with us? Some of them I can't tell. You can tell. I have, I have one that I've, I've, no, one that I've yeah. thought about telling well, Tom, and I'm like, I don't know, and yeah. I might tell it tonight, depending well, on what you tell. You no, know, I, I, my, fa there's just so many great stories, but some of them are, they're almost sacred. I can't, I, you know, if I start telling them, I'm gonna tear up. Yeah, I know, but, I know. Uh, That's why I was just gonna tell a funny one, but, but yeah. you, I'll, I'll tell a funny yeah, one. Yeah, tell us a funny one. Because we, we have, a, can we talk have a few more questions it. coming. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. when we played. Um, Texas A&M in that bowl game where they broke Ty up pretty good. He yeah. broke his collarbone, and and RC Slocum was the other coach on the other team. I was with RC. We serve on a committee, and last week, he's a great man and he's an incredible storyteller. And we were telling Lavelle stories all night long, <laughs> back and forth, back and forth. I was amazed at how many stories he had. This is a coach at Texas A&M, and that he had these stories about Lavelle. And uh, I know one of the things that was crazy about it is I've heard I heard Lavelle swear twice in my all, all the time. Were they both uh, pointed at Jim McMahon? No, no, no one no, was no. at Glenn Kozlowski. <laughs> one was at Glenn, and Tom and I both heard well, that maybe one. it was three. <laughs> yeah. but, but it was because... They they tried to bury us in that game, yeah. and they were trying to you know increase their ranking and everything. And and Lavelle and the part that I love about his mild manner, Lavelle, he was just sticking up for his boys. Yeah. And you know, and I saw it. It was so good for me to just like we got crushed. I don't even know what the score was. Sixty five. Oh, to 40. it was. It was like I, I <laughs> called I that game. I called like that. that game, and it was hard. It to was call. a lot, yeah. a lot to not very many, but. Like, just the, the reason I tell this story is for, I've been around football a long, long time. Lavelle had the patience of a saint. The, the people he was around, Jimmy Mack, and oh, all yeah. the situations, he was just a beautiful man. Yeah. And yes, he the, was. the best stories are the ones that, like, it, I guess I must sum up my favorite is the fact that I can't go anywhere. And I'm, I'm in my 60s. I can't go anywhere in this country that has to do with athletics without somebody grabbing me and saying, hey, uh, let me tell you the story about Lavelle. They all want to tell stories about Lavelle. And that, that's a legend. That's yeah. a legend. Yeah, not not once in my life has anybody ever come up to me and said, yeah, you're old, you're old coach, I don't like him. Never. That's never happened no. to any of us, right? So, yeah, well, I, I was going to tell you a story about him. It's kind of funny, but I'm not sure if I can. I can tell it on this show. Easy, easy coach. So, <laughs> no, so do you know, you know how he used to meet with us after every spring yeah. in his office down yeah, there sure. in Smithfield House? And the Smithfield House is right at the bottom of the stairs coming down from campus. And Lavelle had that mirrored glass window um, that you, you didn't know it was into his office. But you're sitting there talking to Lavelle, and then people are walking by, and they keep looking at themselves in the mirror and everything. And, uh, and he and I were sitting there, and a young lady came down and just decided to really... She looked really close and looked at her teeth and fixed her teeth. She <laughs> fixed her hair. And then she stood up really tall and she like really adjusted her bra. And like Lavelle and I now at this time, we're both looking at that. <laughs> and, and you know how nobody knows how funny Lavelle was, right? So, so it's just kind of quiet for a minute. And then she walks off. And I turn around and I look at Lavelle and I go, well, now that's not something you see every day. And he goes... Obling, if you sit in this chair, yes, you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> and I just thought he always had just the right, just dry kind of remark that would just get us. And, and he had a great sense of humor that only those of us that got to be around him all the time really saw. Everybody thought, oh, he's so stoic. But he was one of the funniest people I've, yeah. I've ever known. Well, something just popped into my mind that it's a good story, and you'll know this, is 
in, in Utah, the weather changes on a dime. Yeah. And you can turn on the, the channels two, four, five, whatever they mm -hmm. might be, and you can try to predict the weather. There's only one person that could be 100% on the weather, and that was Lavelle. Yes. And it was amazing how we would normally have meetings at 2 o'clock and then practice at, like, what, 3? Yeah. 3.10 or something like that. So there'd be times when we'd come in, getting thinking we're coming at, back from school, at two, getting ready for a meeting, they, they'd say, get dressed right now. We're going to go out and practice. Rain's coming. And you look out, and there's not a cloud in the sky. And at about 3.30, <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> comes the rain. He can and, feel it in his he bones. He can feel it in his bones. And, and we, he, we did it all the time. Yes, all he and, knew. And, we, and after about a year, I thought, this guy's crazy. No, this not, how can he do this? He's lucky. Now I know he just had a connection. He's tapped, he's <laughs> tapped in. The, the, the thing I respect for him most is like people are like, why was he such a good coach? And, and I think back on it after all these years, and he had this great knack for creating this, this family environment and with these teams. Like we were, we were brothers that were just going to go battle together. Yeah. And, and he was able to do that. Every year that he coached the this this kind of family, us against the world, um, and he was able to do that. And he gave people responsibility, and he let them go run with that responsibility. And and people thrived under him and wanted to come work here because they knew that he would let them thrive and grow. And he had no ego, and I appreciated that because he had no ego. Coaches wanted to come through and coach and learn and grow and go on and do great things. So so talking about Lavelle as players. How many times do people tell stories about his um, strategy acumen, like on the field? No, Nobody. You're never going to hear stories yeah. about the play he drew up in the fourth quarter that saved the game. You know, that's what, those were for his assistants. Yes. Yeah. All the stories that you learn and love and retell to your kids and grandkids are about the heart. Yes. That's all. Yep, for sure. DF writes in, I remember visiting a ward on the east side of Provo, and to my surprise, Lavelle Edwards opened the door for me <laughs> back in the day. Um, tell us your favorite interaction with Bill Walsh. Oh man, I, 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 it's so hard. I mean, I coached with him for a couple of years. There's yeah. a couple there that I cannot tell. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you, I love, I love Bill Walsh. I think, um, you know, just one of the ones. This might sound crazy, but um, in about my fourth year, I had, or maybe it was my third year, I was in training camp. We had about. Um, maybe halfway through camp, and we had a camp up in Rockland, California, outside of Sacramento. And I get a knock on the door at about six o'clock at night. Open it up, and it's the it's the the guy that's the, you know, I need to see your playbook. It was R.C. Owens, and he's the I can't remember what they called. The, there's a term for it, but you're you're gonna get cut. Like the guy said, I need your playbook, yeah. and Coach wants so, to see you, right? So I go upstairs to see Coach Walsh, and. He's, it's, he's in his office in this dorm room. It's a small little... And you think this is it for you? Oh, it was it. He calls me in and he goes, Hey, Tom, um, I just want you to know that we're going to let you go. You've had a great career. You, you've won a Super Bowl. You got to play on one of the great teams of all time. You have incredible friends with this team. You'll never, ever forget this. But you're a smart guy. You're going to do so much more out of football. But I don't want you to be one of those guys that goes around and tries to catch on and play for right. four or five years on seven or eight different teams, it will not be good for you. You had a great career, call it a career, and it's over. I, I don't... Wow. I was in shock. Wow. And that was it. And I walk out, and I go down and talk to Ricky, and he goes, what? You got caught? What? Well, three days later, no, but and it, was about, it was about four days later, uh, I get a call from the general manager. He says, hey, we're going to sign you back. We need you back. And I'm thinking... He just told me I wasn't good enough to <laughs> say that my time was over. What, was he calculatingly going, we're probably going to sign him back next week, so I don't want him to go try to play with I don't know else. exactly how it was, but when I came back, he looked me in the eye and said, it's time to go. And I'm like, yes, sir, let's go. And I mean, here's what it taught me. He wanted to win games. They made a switch. It didn't work. Something happened. But he had the, you know, he was – strong enough and the leader enough to look me in the eye and go, let's go. I, I can use you. I made a, and he didn't say I made a mistake. I don't think he made a mistake. But, I, I mean, I played for like four more years. Yeah. And yeah. during those four more years, our relationship grew stronger and stronger. So sometimes it's a gospel principle that the adversity and the challenges that you feel in your life, they make you stronger. And so from that, I was always nervous I was going to get cut. And that from that time forward, I just let it fly. I mean, I got cut. 
What, were, then, were you then, a were you a better player down? because of it those way next four years? Better, way better. Because you just played played freely for, for, and played for the moment. And yes, indeed. And and I just kept thinking, well, he's right. I've had an incredible career. Let's just try to squeeze another couple Let's weeks. Go out. have some fun and then up four more years. Pick up a couple more Super yeah, Bowl rings. Right. What, what, <laughs> what, what about George Seifert? And was he similar to Bill? Were they completely different? What what experiences did you have with George? No, they weren't completely different. They were very similar in that they were their incredible commitment to the game, their intellectual appeal to the X's and O's. These are two guys that just, you know, I remember one of George's sons was a ball boy and he was really young. And we said, what does your dad do for fun? He draws plays on napkins. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. They, they were, both of those guys were football wizards. Wizards. Really. Right? And, uh, you know, it, it just, you just learn to, grow with them you could not keep up with them it was impossible to keep up with them from a coach to a player and one of the things i learned there was like they gave us so much but then they back away a little bit so when it came game time they would they, you you had to be smart you had to be intellectual to play on the 49ers because they'd give you tons of stuff but they didn't want to oversaturate you so when game time comes they backed it, backed it, backed it, backed it. And so when it was time to play, they knew exactly what plays you could use, what was perfect for you. But you had to push hard during the week. So like from those experiences, I learned you can, you can be exposed to a ton. But when you, if it, the best coaches, they, they get the players exactly ready. You don't want to give them too much where they're oversaturated, but you don't want to cut it down so much that they yeah. don't have enough. And I think both of them were excellent. I think Bill's really one of his major things is the social change in the league that he brought forward. A lot of people don't give it credit. The Bill Walsh Minority Scholarship, mm -hmm. he was the one that started by giving Jerry Rice's coach at Mississippi Valley and their offensive coordinator an opportunity to come to camp. He invited Jerry's coach to come to our summer training camp for the whole time. And at the time, there were no rules against it. Gave them uniforms and um, just like coaches, they had a locker. They came to every single one of our meetings. They were in the, and, and they did everything. And it was an opportunity for those two young African-American coaches to be exposed to other coaches, great players, an incredible system, and to be able to see and, and learn and grow to feel like, you know what? I did something no one else has done and they gain confidence. From that experience, the NFL, finally, a couple years later, we did it with Tyrone Willingham. We did it with, um, oh my gosh, Marvin Lewis. Mm -hmm. Those were the original yeah. first couple guys that we brought in with the league. And from that time, there's been, I'm going to say, close to maybe a 1,000 minority coaches that have had the opportunity to come in and get a chance. And of those 1,000, Hundreds of them have become college coaches and eventually head coaches in the NFL. Unbelievable. See, I didn't realize that all that whole program started with Bill's vision. That's pretty cool. That's, that's why it's called the Bill Walsh that, Fellowship. That's, that's a legacy. It's, it's right? unreal. It, that's and, really and cool. At that time, people were like, why, why? Well, the reason why was there were no black coaches. Now, I shouldn't say none. Art Shell was a great coach. Right. Mar uh, there's a few other. Tony Dungy. But there were so few. Now, if you look at the game, you know, it, it's, there's a, yeah. a lot more African-American players than white players. And you look and see, and there's way more coaches now that have the opportunity. But it started with Bill. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love the fact that we got to be there when that happened. Yeah. Let's, let's transition to coaching for a sec, because you told me a great story. Um, hopefully you'll remember it. Uh, because you played for Seifert, and then you coached for him. And um, if I'm just remembering it vaguely, but you had a conversation <laughs> with him that was very impactful. And I know you remember it. What, what was it? Well, if this is the one, I, well, I was coaching at the time. I was a DB coach, and, and he was the head coach. But all the time that I played it with the Niners, he was my um, defensive coordinator. Right. And he was, it was a tough one. So I remember, um, well, we're, we're watching, I, I'm coaching now, and we're watching this game. It's in practice. I mean, in uh, during the week of practice, it's late at night, and the defensive staff is watching. He comes and sits down. This guy comes across the middle of the field on the other team, um, drops the ball, 
right in his hand, DB, and drops the ball. And he looks over at me and goes, do you remember that play against the Patriots in 85 when you dropped that ball coming right across the middle? Oh, my goodness. And it was like, it was like just... And I, uh, and I have. Oh, yeah, of course you remember it. <laughs> you remember it, but you would expect that he would remember it. He said, yeah, he was like, w- we, it was third down, and that would have ended the game if you would have picked it off, but they had another chance to win. And lucky for you, we, got, we stopped them on the next play. Oh, man. And this is like a long time later, and, and I'm thinking, he doesn't let anything. This guy's got a mind like a steel trap. Oh. It scared me that he knew all those details. <laughs> Wow. You had Steve Mariucci, who you coached for at Cal, and then he left to go to the 49ers, and then you became the head coach at Cal. So Mariucci also had a big part in your life. Steve is a great guy, fun, super fun guy, great family. He brought a lot of uh, enthusiasm to the game, to the week. He was full of energy, and, uh, you know, I learned a lot from him. Yeah. Uh, The way he dealt with situations – um, way different than a lot of other coaches. He was really good with the players, uh, brought a lot of humor in, way more humor than the hard stick. And um, it, we just coached for Taylor for one year, but in that right. one year we became dear, dear friends. I, I can imagine. I bet he was a good recruiter. Right? He was, oh. seems like he would relate to players and families and do a great job with yeah. recruiting. He, he didn't spend a lot of time in college because he, from he was an assistant. He had one year with the, That's right, and then, and then he, he went boom up yeah. to the Niners. Yeah, well, you you were coaching um, the defensive backs with Bill Walsh at Stanford back in '92 when Seifert brought you back to the Niners to coach the defensive backs, including Dion, right? Dion Sanders, who's now going to be a coach. For Colorado, like it's all like like one big circle. What, what's your favorite Dion story? Um, and if we counted right, you won your fourth Super Bowl ring with with Dion and company in 1994, right? Mm. Um, yeah. What, what's he like? And do, and do you have any fun stories from Dion? Well, and what's going to be like to have him in the league now? For, let me tell a story first. <laughs> and that was I was it was my first year as a DB coach of the Niners. We're in the preseason, it's our last preseason game. It's at Candlestick, and after the game, we're in the Niner locker room. And it's people are getting ready. It's we've broken camp. The next day, two days from then, we're gonna start the regular season. And we're in the locker room, and I'm talking to some of the DBs afterwards. And all of a sudden, Dion comes in to our locker room in street clothes with his entourage. <laughs> and I went to Ray Rhodes, who's the defensive coordinator, and said, Ray Bob, what's Dion doing in the locker room? He goes, We just signed him. He's gonna play for us. I'm like, Oh my gosh, that's I got to coach him. <laughs> I'm, the DB, I'm the DB coach. You've got prime I time. I, I got to coach Ray, him. I can't coach Dion. <laughs> but I, I was a, it was a great time because I also had Tim McDonald, oh, Martin Hanks, man, you Eric had some, Davis, you had some dudes, and uh, they were super good. So what but was it I, like coaching I Dion? Dion? Dion was, uh, we, it was a one year, one season, one yeah. even a year. It was from the he wasn't going to play preseason. No, There's of no course way. not. <laughs> so he signed right then. We had him for one year. I mean, he's the defensive player of the year in the NFL. We won the Super Bowl. Yeah. And um, see, who needs camp? Man, he was just such a he was <laughs> such a nice guy. He was friendly. He's a family guy and. And the thing that was interesting, he has like this prime, you know, he's prime. Prime time. Prime time. Coach Prime now. And, but he had this persona that it was so easy. And it was for him. But he studied hard mm-hmm. when no one was looking. Right. He had an incredible mind for the game. He knew a lot of things. He learned tricks. And one of the things he did back in the day before the internet, he had, or cell phones, he had a Rolodex of all the players. He knew every player's name. He'd call people up during the week. A DBs and say, hey, I'm watching this game. How'd you do that? Why'd you do that? So when he'd go into a game, people think it was just total skill, which he had plenty. Yeah, he had lots of skill. But he backed it up with a lot of intelligence. Yeah. Is there anybody faster with a football after an interception or a punt return than him running right in front of you off Maybe the sideline? Maybe Jerry line? Rice. Yeah. Maybe Rice. So here's the thing about Jerry. Jerry was probably the fourth or fifth fastest player on our team yeah. if you got him on a stopwatch. But functional speed... In his helmet and shoulder pads and cleats, you, when he got that ball in his hands or when he was running a route, there was no one close to him. But I remember the first day that Prime was in practice, and they, everyone on the field, everyone on the field, the custodians, the lawn guys, every <laughs> manager, every player, they're looking in line one on one. Is Dion going to match up against Dion's Jerry? Dion's in one line and Jerry's in the other. 
and they weren't matching up. And then all of a sudden, everyone's like, here it comes. <laughs> and the two guys, they don't even shake a head at it. They get up there, and everybody stopped practice. Just the to other, watch those the two? Other drills, <laughs> the other drills just stopped. And it was like, oh, boy, this is going to be a good season. Those two guys went at it oh, who was, hard. Who, who was throwing to them right then? Was it, was, it, was it Steve? Steve. Oh, okay. man. Yeah. Now, now where, Steve's coming on next week. So where was, like, because I think Steve's going to claim he was in the top five fastest on the team at that time. Was that true? Steve's fast. Yeah. He might claim it. It might be right. I would not. <laughs> I would not say no. He was pretty, like, I, he's amazingly fast. People don't realize how, like, flat out fast Steve was. And super athletic. Yeah, crazy athletic, so. I, I find it fascinating that a handful of the greatest names to ever play the game of football were your teammates. Yeah. Or guys you coached. Yeah, you know, it's, I think about this a lot. Um, you know, I've, I've been able to go back to the Hall of Fame on a number of occasions. So your whole team. my friends are getting <laughs> inducted <laughs> into the Hall of Fame. And, you know, that, that's a blessing just to be able to rub shoulders with these guys. But it's like the greatest thing right now is I, you know, on my phone, I have a text string. It's called, it's the 49er DBs. Yeah. And it's Ronnie Lott and Carlton Williamson and Eric Wright and Dwight Hicks. Oh, man. Dwight Hicks and the Hot Licks. <laughs> and, and, and Jeff Fuller and, and uh, Chet Brooks and all these guys that were during the time that we played. And we, we send this, we finished, I finished up in 1989 as a player. It was a long time ago. Some of these guys before me and we're still brothers. Yeah. And yeah. so like the rings don't really matter. The, the, the honors and all that stuff, the jerseys, it doesn't really matter. It's just what matters is that all that time that we spent together, the blood, sweat and tears, it, it counted for us so much that our relationships now today are stronger than they were back then. And I love that fact. Let's build on that uh, with Tom Homo here tonight on The Wise Guys. This game of football is giving you the high of highs, four-time WAC <laughs> champion, four-time Super Bowl champion. It's also brought you to your knees. Head job at Cal didn't work out like you'd hoped. You become an associate director at BYU, associate athletic director in the middle of a firestorm uh, where a lot of uh, the head coaches dismiss, a number of others are out, and then 2005, you become the athletic director, and here you are getting ready for another season. So Blaine and I would like to know what it is about this love for this game that you have that has kept you yeah. through it all. Believe me, that's what it is. I mean, it's just I love the game. I love the people that play it. And uh, one of the things I've learned at BYU is, you know, I, have, I, I played football, baseball, basketball, and ran track when I was a kid growing up. And, you know, when you start concentrating on football in college and pro. But when I got to BYU, one of the things people asked me as a coach, I, I had failed as a coach, as a head coach. I, I felt that I had done a good job as an assistant, but as a head coach, I had failed. But when I got to BYU, the question was going to be for our family. Lavelle brought me back and said, hey, look, you need to come chill out mm -hmm. at BYU. <laughs> yeah. You know, we'll see. You come here. It's your people. You'll, you'll give us something good. But after that, you determine what you want to do. And then, so people say, you want to coach? You want to get back into coaching? But when I was there, I got to know all the other athletes from the other sports, yeah. women's teams, men's teams. And I found out it's just not the football team. All these kids are dynamite. They're strong. They're beautiful. They're courageous. They're vulnerable. They have highs. They have lows. They have dreams. Some of them have come from terrible situations. Some of them are going to make it. Some of them aren't. And, and that was just like being on a team. Yeah. So I kind of put myself in a position to say, all right, I'm not going to be their coach, but I'm going to mentor a lot of these kids. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend more of my time than maybe some of my peers that are really, really good at um, compliance or business or fundraising or whatever marketing. I, I didn't have any of those skills. So I just went back to Lavelle. And he hired a bunch of people to do that. So I right. hired a bunch of people. <laughs> we all learned that. that from Lavelle. And then I spent the time that most of my time just connecting with the coaches and the players. And yeah. like, you know, like just I'm going to go to, uh, I don't know, I might go to 100 games this year. Right. When, it, when you add them all up and uh, all the different sports. And every one of them will be my bliss. 
That's what I do. I love it. And your wife's such a good sport because oh, she's man. sitting right yeah, next to you. Have you been? Have you even been back? I don't know if you've done. Have you gone back to like nationals with cougarettes? Even have yeah, you ever done yeah, that? Yeah, I have. Yeah. See, he gets to do it all. Like this is the greatest <laughs> job ever. That's I've, I've decided that that may because we've gone a couple times. That may be more intense than playing in a bowl or anything like that. That is intense. It's super intense, but it's well worth it. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, my, I call them the Cougs. Yeah, the Cougs. The Cougs. The, they're they're super good, and they just they doubled up two years in a row where yeah. they won hip hop and uh, jazz. But they they're they're different, and, and each one of our teams and each one of the sports brings a uniqueness to the the kind of the acumen of that sport and what they need to do to fulfill it. But the leadership, the culture, all those things are the same in all the sports. Resonates it from, it doesn't matter if it's Cougs or it's the track team or it's, it's a football the team, it all goes yeah. goes across. And, and Sam, and then, that's great. Sam from uh, Bakersfield, California says hello. Spencer from Lubbock, Texas says, Tom's the best AD BYU's ever had. We love you, Tom. That's a running theme throughout Cougar Nation, uh, and a lot of it has to do with what Blaine's about to ask you, yeah, which has it, brought us to where we are today. It's, it's, so so we, Dave and I were reflecting September 10th, 2021. That name, that, that day will resonate to you. Kevin Worthen, the president of BYU, accepts BYU's invitation to join the Big 12. He says this, and I quote, there's no way the Cougars would be in this position if it hadn't been for Tom Homo. So then the next day, we go out, and BYU beats Utah in front of a sold-out crowd at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. So we get the Big 12 announcement. Next day, Utah B. Is there a better two-day period in the history of BYU sports than those right there? Yeah, I think there's some good ones. Two-day period. Well, That's yeah, just it one has to be back-to-back day. days. Two yeah. day. It can't even be a whole weekend. It's back-to-back. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, it's like it all is part of one big hole for me. I mean, that's why I, I see, like, I've been in so many different situations at BYU that have been, it's just what you dream of. So, like, to think that that's a better dream? <laughs> no, it's just all part of the same dream. It's all the dream. And you're living it. You're it's living all the part dream. of the same. And it started when this little punk kid, my mom and dad, they had a 72 uh, coal, uh, Cutlass. And they towed my 62 Volkswagen Bug from L.A., came up to Provo. You know how it used to be, two yeah. weeks in the dorms at the uh, Helam and Hall. When they drove me up, they unpacked their bags and said, it's going to be a long ride home. we got to go. And I'm like, what, can you not stay the night or like you're gone? And they left and I just cried like a baby. Yeah. And I thought, how in the world am I going to do this? This place is so foreign. It's such a strange place. Yeah, yeah. And I love now, like fast forward, however many years it's been, it's a beautiful place. It's just home. It's just, it's an unbelievable place, it's, it's but just, it's about the people. Yeah. You know, and, and from for the first day in that dorm, I remember there's a song by um, Little River Band that uh, Scott Colley, who was Austin, right. and look around you. No, I don't know All these guys, um, you know, they were in the dorms and we were all in the same situation. We were all just a bunch of snot nosed freshman kids and we're like starting off our dream. And these were who we had. That's it. You had to depend on each other. And so, like, I, I talked to Scott today. It's just like amazing. And and we just, like, that's what you turn to each other because that's yeah. all you got. And my parents went home that day, and, you know, I was homesick a little bit that year, but sure. my family was the Cougs. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's what yeah. still is. Out. Yeah, and isn't it fun that you can, like, if you didn't see Scott Colley for 10 years and didn't talk to him, and then you ran into each other, it wouldn't be, it'd no. be the same, right? It's like yeah. your brothers, and you would just pick right up where you left off, which is, yeah. which is the magic of playing sports and being out there every day together and mm -hmm. being in meetings together. And it, it, really, it really creates a camaraderie that lasts a lifetime. Only if you sacrifice and pay the price when you're together originally. Right. Like how many times you talk to people and go, hey, what a, this might, they're going to go to their 30th high school reunion. No, I'm not going to go to my reunion. And, uh, and you know right away, if you don't go to your high school reunion, then you must not have had a great You didn't have a great experience. experience. But, like, I'm going to be at my reunion because <laughs> we had a great experience. And that's what's like, that's why I tell all the student athletes right now. This is the time. If you pay the price right now and you sacrifice for your teammates and are not selfish and you just go out there and give everything you go, you got, it lasts forever. It lasts forever. And that's yeah. why you can say 40 years later,
Scott and I, it's like, yeah. boom, yep. we were right back there. Friday night, it was late. I was, I was walking, walking you home. home. We you got go. down to the gate, and so you can I sing was for Journey. dreaming of I don't know night. why you wouldn't take that offer from Journey. It's reminiscent. <laughs> reminiscent. Reminiscent is a song. Be what you're at the church. Yeah, we sing on the show. Tom Homo's on the Wise Guys tonight. During <laughs> BYU's... He lied. He lied to start the show. We're he said he couldn't sing, and then he just sang, and it was actually right on on pitch. During that 1980 season that ended with Jim McMahon's Hail Mary to Clay Brown, um... You had seven interceptions that year. Why isn't that always in the same sentence as you, you led the whack in interceptions in 80, but we always just talk about Jim McMahon's passing yards and his last pass. You had a great year, 1980. And that's how it should be. <laughs> no, seven interceptions yeah, is yeah. off the charts. Come yeah, on. But listen, like, I'm going to be real because this is, this is what this show is about. Right. So, like, I'm, I, look, I'm too old to be too egotistical about my stats. <laughs> when you get seven interceptions as a sophomore, it's in relation that they're throwing the ball to you. Like the best. <laughs> oh, the be I'm going to tell you right now. Who was the other corner? Who's playing opposite you, the Bill? Bill? Shefflin. Yeah, Bill and was. As you guys know, oh, I'm going to say Bill Shefflin's the best corner, listen to me now, to ever play at BYU. He was ridiculous. And, and like, they didn't throw to his side. So, like, forever. I did have seven interceptions. Yeah. I led the conference. <laughs> yes, you did. But they didn't say how many balls got thrown at <laughs> me. That, no, he's, that being, he's not being good. No, I'm going to say, but look, it, it's like I really think that, like, that was Jim's team. And that's how we want it to be. And this is important. Like, guys on that team were not selfish. And so they wanted, like, they just, it, you wanted to serve and make everything possible to give Jim the ball. So yeah. on defense, it was get the ball back for the offense. Yeah, because Jim's going to score. Get the ball back for Jim. Here's what I used to do. When I would come off the field as a defensive back, I would barely go to the I would never go to the bench unless Coach Felt wanted me to come over there. I'd take a knee on the sideline because you didn't want to miss a thing. Yeah. Every single game, you didn't want to miss a play. McMahon playing ball there during that period of time, it was magic. Yeah. And you just can't miss a thing. So, like, when you have the offense and the defense and the special teams totally knit together, you can't lose except for the first game against – New Mexico. Yeah, well, that yeah, was, that was sure crazy. That Jim, Jim, my favorite thing with Jim was, and this is the next year, right? Um, we're in meeting rooms. Tolner's running the meeting, and Jim turns the light on, and we're just barely started watching film, and and Ted's like, "What? What's up?" And he goes, "Is this what these guys are going to run?" And then Ted says, "Yeah," and he goes, "We're just wasting our time in here. Like, we'll destroy these people. We don't need to watch any more film." Ted goes, "Everybody good?" We go, "Yeah, we're good. Done. Five minute meeting." <laughs> and I think Jim that threw six. That doesn't think, happen very much no, in meetings. I think Jim threw six touchdowns against them. Probably. So, so, it, so it was Colorado 80, State. They weren't good then. In the eighty, the game ends that way. Eighty-one, you're back in the Holiday Bowl against Washington State. You get a pick six. You run into the end zone, arms up in the air. Was that not the coolest? That's fun. I mean, my favorite pick was my senior year against Georgia. That's yeah. my favorite so, of yours. Yeah, I had to pick six against Georgia, but here's the reason why. Pick it off, and I run, and I, I get all the way down 62 yards or something yeah. like that, and I get into the end zone, and I look up into the stands, and I see my mom and dad. Uh, it was crazy. It was at Athens, Georgia. It was only 90,000 fans there. Yeah, and it's in Athens, Georgia. I look up, and the first people I see are my mom and dad. And I'm like, that is a tender mercy right there. That's sure. so cool. Like, what and there's the 88,000 people yeah, there in Sanford Stadium, absolutely. and your mom and dad stand right out. And had Steve not thrown six interceptions, we might want to get Oh, my gosh. So I, was gonna, I wasn't going to ask, we'll you ask about him that. about that but one. He and I have talked about this. It's like, <laughs> it's like a whole different deal. We're playing Buck Ballou at quarterback and Herschel Walker at tailback and, and 88,000 fans in the stands. And, and Steve just keeps throwing interceptions. And, and and you guys keep going out there and holding Georgia down. What was the final of that game? Like 17-14? 17-14. Like how frustrating is that to play that good a game against a, a, that good a talent in that environment and hold them to seven? They win on a last-second field goal by Butler. Yeah, I probably was mad at the time, but I'm going to go back. You know, I always try to make, make the most of the situation. Without that game, Steve Young doesn't become. He becomes, he, yeah, he, he becomes Steve be. Young after that. Yeah, so like I remember Lavelle going at halftime, and I think he had a four of them at halftime, and one yeah. of them was a pick six. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Lavelle's talking to the team somehow. It's like, Steve's going to go out there and do a great job. And I'm like, are we watching the same <laughs> game, Lavelle? But like right now, I'm going to say, his, he battled back 
hard. And then after that, he was great. He had a great. He was a first team All American. Oh, man, he he was. Yeah. I, I tell people I've never seen somebody work harder and go from here to here further than Steve Young over the course of the, we watched it. Yeah. We watched him. Um, crazy athletic guy, really really smart guy. Not great fundamentals to start with. He made himself into one of the greatest players that ever played. Yeah. And and it was fun to watch. He's one of a kind. Really, yeah. really one of a kind. And it's not so much for what he does on the field. He's got this personality and his this character. His character is impeccable. Yeah. And like I've seen him in very, 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 very difficult situations where I'm gonna think, All right, big boy, let's see how you handle this one. Yeah. And he, he never ceases to amaze me. Yeah, those those are those are great days. Uh, we want to talk to you a little bit about um, the this Big Twelve thing. They recently Big Twelve is great, and then all of a sudden, new news drops on us here just last week with the addition of Utah, Arizona, Arizona State, and Colorado, the four, four corner schools from the Pac-12. That was a crazy weekend, Tom. Like Thursday night, we're going, hey, they're having a meeting tomorrow morning, and it looks like the Pac-12 is going to stay together. And by noon the next day, it's announced that. Two are going to the Big Ten, and those four are coming to join you in the Big 12. It, it's 16 teams now in the Big 12, but it also re reunites BYU with Utah, who's been a long-standing rivalry and in the same league for most of history. Mm -hmm. um, there's mixed reactions from Cougar Nation. Some people are like, oh, leave them out in the cold. We don't want them in. And others have said, this is great. We love the rivalry. H how do you feel about all of this? I'm on the side of those that say, I love the rivalry. Yeah. That's, just, that's the answer. And I, I just, I think that so from being, we've, I've been in the meetings for a year and a half now with um, Big 12. Mm -hmm. So I've seen Oklahoma and Texas have been in those meetings partially. Yeah. And then they're asked to leave when we're talking membership. But I've been, I've seen, I feel, I'm starting to feel the culture. Went from Bob Bowlesby to... Um, our, uh, your mark, yeah. For, for, to Brett Yormark, our new commissioner. And I've seen that transition. And you see the vulnerability of conferences these days. You know, obviously the SEC is very strong. Mm -hmm. The Big Ten is very strong. But the ACC, you never thought you'd see some cracks. Right. right. Pac-12, you never oh, in my day. I grew up in L.A. It blew me away. Never thought I'd see that day. So one of the things, like as we talked, even before last or the last couple of weeks, we needed to strengthen the Big 12 as much as we could when, whenever we could. We have a contract that's going to go six or seven years, yeah. and then this could, we're going to be right back to the same thing again. Right. So when you see Brett Yormark talking about um, Gonzaga mm -hmm. and basketball and UConn and all sports, and there's so, uh, some other ideas, what he's trying to do is make us as strong as we possibly can be. And we get stronger by adding Utah. Yes. No one is gonna. No one can argue with that. Right. You're not gonna weaken yourself by bringing Utah into the conference. You're gonna get stronger. Now I get it. I get the Utah BYU thing. I played in those games. And yeah. So did you. Yeah, I know. I and remember. I know for a fact that you <laughs> won't say, "I want. I want that game." You want that game? Oh, I want that game. So look, I mean, most. You, I don't think there's. Hey, a one player, of our brothers' coaches up there. I don't right? think if there's ever a a player that played at BYU would ever say. Man, I don't want Utah in the conference. I, I, I want that game Thanksgiving weekend every year. I don't know if that's going to happen. I know that that's like, I'm telling <laughs> that you. That would be a nice asked, spot. You mentioned, you, you say, I want, I, that's what I want. I want it the last game of the season every year. I don't know that we can do that in this league, but I do want it every year, and we'll likely get yeah. them every year now, right? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned a brother of ours is on the staff. He's not on the staff. He's the head coach. Well, we have, yeah. And well, Freddie's a brother, too, who's well, on the staff, right? Who's true. actually Kyle's brother and our brother. Yeah, right? so we have some connections. But hey, this is a story that I kind of want to share you know, with Cougar Nation a little bit. I've told it years ago, but... So when I went up there to play on our last game of the regular season against Utah, at Utah, we had to stop them on defense to win the game. And they, they were, it was fourth down. We stopped them. We won the game. It was a hard-fought game. There was a guy on their team on the other side that was a great – he was an all-conference player for the um, WAC back in those days, Lonnie Lawson. Oh, yeah. He was very yeah. good. And from the very beginning of the game, he's chirping at me on the sideline, chirping at me. I'm like, dude, we are both DBs. We're never going to get to play <laughs> against each other. But if you want to come out here right now. Come on. We're, right, let's we're, go. <laughs> we're talking of a big storm. And it's crazy. And he's yapping the whole game. He plays a really good game. We, we, but this guy's like in my craw. Yeah. 
So the game's over. We go on. I get drafted by the 49ers. The 49ers sign as a free agent, Lonnie oh, Lawson no. from Utah. I didn't know that. And I'm thinking, what in the world? I mean, this is crazy. How in the world am I going to have this guy as a teammate? We're brothers. Yeah. You know, we played one year together. He got injured, and he couldn't play after that. But it was kind of an interesting thing to think, you know, if that dude was on my team, I'd love him. But if he's on the other team, I'm no, not going like to love him. You're not going to love him. Not going to love him. You know, I think like, there's such respect and camaraderie in those games. Whatever, the, it doesn't matter if football or any other sport. And, you know, I get it for the fans. I love our fans. I like the fact that they get so emotional and they get so compassionate. I mean, so crazy. They get crazy. Yeah. And, it, and then the back and forth with social media, we didn't have to deal with that when we were kids. True, yeah. But all of that stuff right now, we, we, gotta, we just got to look that we're going to be in the same conference. It's going to make us stronger. We're both going to benefit from it. But when we play, let's go. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Hey, if I play anybody in my family in anything, I, I'm like, you want to beat them. You play to win. Yeah, play. I don't and, and care what it is. the same way. Yeah, and that's yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm talking so, about their players and coaches. Definitely. Yeah. The same oh yeah. yeah. And, and, and for for Tom and I, like Tom came from California, and I, I think you're probably similar. I came from New York. I didn't know anything about this Utah BYU rivalry no. until I got here. I quickly learned, but I was like, what's what's all this fuss about? Why are the fans fighting each other in the state? Yeah, let me tell <laughs> like, you how I learned about it. So my freshman year, I redshirted, so I wasn't playing, but I went up to the game. It was in Salt Lake, and my I had an aunt and uncle that lived on the bench there in Holiday. And they're good friends of mine. They weren't members of our faith, but they're my dear, dear aunt and uncle. So I told them I was going to come up after the game. Well, at halftime, it was 16 nothing Cougs. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I'm out of here. It's cold. Yeah, yeah. I'm never standing on the sideline. <laughs> and, and, I, and so I go up and, and I go up to see my aunt and uncle. We're at game's over. I'm not playing. I'm out of here. That we lost 23-16. Oh, no. I mean, that's the first time I figured out, okay, yeah. you better stay to the it's, end. It's, in these games, it doesn't matter who's more talented on any given year. It's, a, it's fun. So, so College Football Blue Bloods published uh, just this last week a, a best rivalries in college football uh, thing. and they We want to see if you agree. Yeah, and they have BYU and Utah at number 10. So we're going we're gonna to tell you that. We'll preview that. Um, here's who they have in front. Ohio State, Michigan, number one. Which I'm not so sure. I think Alabama, Auburn has been pretty big. But Ohio State, Michigan, one. Texas, Oklahoma, two. Auburn, Alabama, three. Notre Dame, SC, four. Georgia, Florida, five. Texas, Texas A&M, six. How does Texas get to? Oregon and Washington, seven. Michigan, Michigan State, eight. Florida, Florida State, nine. BYU, Utah, ten. I think for sure, number one's Hatfields and McCoys. Yeah, that's that, big time. That's number one. Not these guys. Here's what I'm going to say. It doesn't matter. Like the rivalry when I was in high school, that's the number one rivalry. It doesn't matter what other people think about the rivalry. True. It just matters about the two schools playing. Yeah. That's the great thing about sports is that those rivalries come together, and I don't care where we're ranked. I put because us, in my I, mind, I got, I got us right. I got us right there I, up at five. I got us number one. <laughs> that's true. That's, that's true. That you should. Hey, Alan Abbott. Says, thanks, Tom, for being my friend back in the 80s on the football team. Oh, my Andy Abbott. Is it? Oh, there we go. See? That's, not, that's going back to 1977. That's old school. You know, people, people have been commenting that you're, rep, that you're repping this yeah, Berkeley, Berkeley shirt. Berkeley, Berkeley's on our live Berkeley stream tonight. Berkeley shirt. They're like, what is that? Tom's repping the Berkeley shirt. What's that so, all about? Berkeley is a, a great brand. Where are we at? Pull your no, mic you back in here. Yeah, we oh, can yeah. see it. Yeah, Berkeley's so, a great brand. It's uh, my son's brand. Oh, that's it. That's okay. right. That's okay. <laughs> but, um, see, there you go. Here we are. We're talking about stop the stigma, and my son's really strong and about mental health. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, it's sing I, I'm super proud of him that he's socially conscious in this area, and this is an area where at BYU, every day. We have to be able to strengthen our young men and young women, student athletes, because in this day and age, it's hard to fight that. Yeah. But it, we, we talk about it every day. It's, there's no stigma. And so he came out with his shirt, and I said, give me that shirt. Yes. <laughs> so I, I he's repping that. it. We're I glad he's it. on our live stream That's tonight, great. too. Um, what is your plan to replace Utah that was scheduled for next September 7th and then for six years after that? But... You schedule games so far in advance now. All of a sudden, September 7th, is, that's like 13 months away. Yeah. What, how do you go find somebody? The plan is call Dave Brown. 
<laughs> Dave so, Brown's our old ESPN yeah, friend. Yeah, ESPN friend. Oh, he's my dear, dear friend. And he's, he helps, doesn't he? But he's vote. good at helping mega games. Yeah, do you want a mega game? I'm or do you want about 12, 12 years of scheduling. Yeah. He was my wingman. Oh, man. And Dave, we still, we've talked about three times this week. Okay. So there's, what you got to fi- understand is there are no very, very few games that right. are even available when you're talking about 13 months out. So that one's going to be a tricky one because there's only a, I mean, there are literally four or five games that are realistic that you can play the game. Is, is the philosophy moving forward now that you're in a Power Five league and the schedule? We're going to talk about the schedule. We're going to have DJ bring it up in, in a sec. In fact, go ahead and bring that up, DJ, while we're getting into this. But um, you know, do you schedule an FCS opponent and then an FBS opponent that's in a, in a G Five league, and then maybe you know, and and then maybe one uh, P Five or what? What's the philosophy on all of this now when you've got to play such a rigorous? League schedule. I mean, Utah this year opens with Florida and Baylor. That can't be the the formula. Well, I think I don't know if you all understand this, but our schedule for this year, yeah, was supposed to be open up Tennessee at home. Yeah. I know. Second game USC and LA. Third game at Arkansas. But but then the back end was going to be a little lighter because well, yeah. But yeah. I'm saying if we wouldn't have got rid of those games, yeah, imagine would've, it would have taken imagine. out Sam Houston and so yeah. Utah. So so we're looking so at that's that schedule. What Utah has Utah has that this year. That's yeah. a tough schedule. That's yeah. a so crazy schedule. I, I don't think you can turnkey it and go A B C. People talk about that, but I think when you're in a P5 and and people will understand this, you can't. We'll have to take care of the next two years pretty much. You just got to find someone to get in there. Right. But I think like. Down the road, you'll be able to maybe right. find some unique games. But it's always good to be able to, to find a game that really th- – these teams that we're playing, like that Sam Houston game is because Tennessee got out of it the game right. last year, right. like within right. a, underneath a year. Um, uh, Blue, Blue Maple says, hey, maybe we could schedule one of those Pac-4 schools that, that are probably going to be looking for games at this point, right? It's, it's possible. Those are, those are possibilities. But like, like I said, during those scheduling years of independence – what we think works out great for us <laughs> is not always magical for them. Yeah, that's so, so true. So BYU true. has 21 intercollegiate sports. Let's talk about them for a few minutes with Tom Homo, <laughs> athletic director. It's good to have him with us on the, the Wise Guys. Um, and, and before we get into men's hoops, Russ on the live stream tonight asked a question for you about uh, the question is, what can we do to help with NIL? This coming from Russ and Cougar Nation. Um, all the sports are dealing with it. Men's hoops, that's been in the news lately as a, one of the players left, and Mark Pope was talking about it the other day, saying it's, it's my fault I didn't get the job done on the NL side from, from my aspect. Um, and then Russ comes in with his question, well, what can the fans do to help? Yeah, I think there's two ways to look at this. NIL is kind of quid pro quo. We have a number of our athletes, a number of them, that go out and find someone in the community that's willing to pay them to come and make an appearance or something like that. Mm-hmm. You could have... You know, someone can get a free meal at name the restaurant in Provo. I'm not going right. to go out on a limb. Right. And then um, they'll get a free meal for, for repping them in social media. That's true NIL. The collective is a different story. Collectives are kind of bigger money. Maybe you're, po- you're pooling all this money, and then you put it amongst basketball or football or women's soccer or women's volleyball, whatever it might be. Right. And that money is then kind of, there's still kind of a quid pro quo. You have to still do something. A lot of times it's charitable organizations and things like that. So we have a Royal Blue Collective, and money can be contributed They've to They've been that. here on this show and explained yeah, how it Yeah, we had them here, and they, they talked a little bit, Tom, about um, the, the, the goal for BYU is maybe different than some other institutions, and I love what they were talking, what they were talking about. Um, they said, we, we not only want to give these guys an opportunity to make some extra money to help them, we want them to have experiences and to be networked to mentors and to be able to learn how to build businesses. We want to teach them skills uh, that when they leave and they're not playing the sport that they're playing anymore, they have a lifetime of skills and network of people that they can make a living the rest of their life, which is different than a lot of other programs. And, and approaches. how does that sound to you? If I'm a mom or dad, that's where <laughs> I want my people. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to make it not just, it can't just be about the money. I said this a thousand times, you know, money's important. This is a business. This is the budget at BYU Athletics is a lot of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And but it can't be the primary objective of what you're doing. This is even outside the budget of BYU. So we have to be very careful 
We have to be strategic. We understand and we're, we're, I'm open to uh, NIL deals and the collective deals, but we want to be able to do it our way. Once again, right. if we're going to try to look and see what name the school from the SEC does, we would fail. We'd fall flat on our face because it, it's not us. But if we can do it the way that we design it and it's coming together right now, it's, I think it's going to be great. We put the links up to the Royal Blue Collective on YouTube, Facebook, YSGuys.com, and Twitch. Uh, and and, uh, and if I'm hearing you right and you, you want to help, go there and that's how you can do it. That's right. Yeah. I, I think um, it's interesting because it just depends. It's like it's beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Some of our donors... They want to give to scholarships. Yeah. Some of our donors want to give to buildings. Some of our donors want to give to nutrition. And some of our donors want to give it to the players. And I say, find your, find your lane what, and what go to What makes you feel good about it, right? We have all these contributions, which, whichever way it goes, it's going to help these kids. It's going to help our programs, our teams. It's going to help our department. Men's hoops in uh, Italy and Croatia, the 18th through the 27th. I thought it was an interesting stat that I saw. Big 12 all-time wins. Number one, Kansas with 2,385. Number two, Arizona with 1,929. And number three, the of Cokes. all the Big 12, BYU with 1,916. How about that? I saw that. I was surprised to see that. I mean, you, you have these Big 12 conf, uh, you know, conference teams that have been there for a long, long time, played a lot of games. But then you go back to Stan Watts and those days, you combine that with Roger, Re um, coach from UCLA. That had Danny. Frank Arnold. Oh, Frank, oh, Frank Arnold. Arnold, yeah. Roger Reed. Um, all, you know, Steve Lionel Cleveland. Steve you just go Cleveland. right through. That's a lot of games. That's a lot of years. That's a lot of wins. Our mm -hmm. basketball program has been successful. Yeah. And, and when you look at this statistic and you look at the summation of the wins, it's pretty special. Yeah, we, we noted that uh, that Nate Austin was named as an assistant coach. We were over at um, open media practice before they headed off and got to visit with Nate and the group. Um, many think that... that of all of the programs uh, at BYU, that maybe that one is the one that's going to have to adjust the most, not because they haven't been good, but because the quality of play in that league, in men's basketball, it's like not even close to the best and most powerful basketball league in America. What, what, what has to happen for them to be able to compete in that league? Well, I, I think you're right. I mean, we've looked at all the, all the sports. We've talked to all of our coaches. I, I like to get these rundowns and see what they're – the, how we match up, because those yeah. are different matchups now, totally yeah. different matchups, and recruiting and how you recruit and all that. And you can see, obviously, that the RPIs from the Big 12 Basketball Conference last year, I shouldn't say RPI, net in basketball, are unbelievable. Yeah. It's daunting. But here's what I'm going to say. You just read this stat. We're not sliced liver right there. Right. We, we're, we've been good for a, quite a long time. I think that the Marriott Magic... I think that a fine number of our kids that are starting to come into their own. We had a, a, an interesting strategy last year with a, a relatively short, not short, but we didn't have a real big. But right. you got a guy in Foos that can play the fi five at six, five? Six, 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 six five, five, yeah. Whatever. But Seven, six you, wingspan, that you know, helps. In, you, have some, you have now an opportunity to be able to compete against the best. And that's what I've always said. I wanted to get into the big uh, to a p5 or autonomous five not for the money i want to get in because i want to play compete. the best teams every single every yeah. single week and this this is going to refine us it's going to teach us what we need are we going to need to get taller are we going to need to get bigger I'm, i'll go with foos any day of the week mm -hmm. but i think um i think that coach pope has been able to bring in some people this year there's looking on the in the future with missionaries out in the field and the future in the state and recruiting and everything. We just have to be able to continue to build this culture, and um, it's it's hard to do that in transition years. Right. So we're transitioning. Other schools are transitioning. The Big Twelve teams aren't. They're just reloading. Yeah. And so that first year will be a transition year and transition year. It'll be the same thing for football. Yeah. It'll be the same thing for. Like women's soccer was picked to win it. That's going to be a transition to all of a sudden new places to travel, new matchups, new competitions, new fields, new venues, all of those things. And But I'm, I'm thinking that the Marriott Magic, I was going to say this, we're going to win some of those games at home yeah. that people don't at think At elevation we have a with that crowd, 
I, I had a fun fun experience. I got and to, there are guys. Yeah, and I got I got to introduce. Uh, um, after the thing, I got to do an interview with Foose, but I had Jeff Chapman stayed with us this week. He was in town, and right, right, I got right. to introduce introduce Jeff to Foose because a lot of people say, "Hey, Foose's game reminds me of Jeff Chapman's yeah. game," and to watch those two interact and Jeff mentor and all that was just really a thrill for me to watch those two get together. And I thought, man, if we can teach Foose to shoot that 15 foot baseline jump shot like Jeff Chapman, <laughs> we're gonna, we're in business. Yeah, Foose would be in business. We are in sure. business. Jeff Chapman's hands are about two twice mine. Yeah, he had that control, that ball. What oh. a great shooter. So, so uh, Gavin said to me because Jeff was over, and he goes, "Dad, I remember Jeff. You know, we've seen him a lot." But he goes, "Every time I see him, I'm just in awe of his hands. Yeah. His hands are this big." Oh, he was. A, he's a great gentleman. Yeah, women's basketball. They're already overseas. They're the Czech Republic, Austria, and Slovenia, and Italy. They come back on the thirtieth. Uh, a comment about uh, Amber Whiting's recruiting. In just the first 18 months on the job, and we've had a lot of them on here. In fact, we had one who'd committed from Canada right live on our on our show, um, the number two player in Canada. It's fascinating to me that a, pl- a coach can come from Burley, Idaho, from Burley High School, and step in and build the kind of roster her and her staff have built in such a short period of time. It's about the heart. It doesn't matter if she came from Burley. I mean, there's a lot of people that come from a lot. That's of not a knock on Burley. Small. You're just coming from high school. Hey, well, I'm just saying, <laughs> you got to start somewhere. Yeah. But there's just like, it's, the, it's just about timing and kind of sometimes the stars are aligned, but she's got a great plan. Yeah. And, you know, I saw that plan when we were um, in the interview process and there's great candidates out there, but there's like, she had this confidence in a plan that included recruiting. And, you know, like, you don't really recruit, but her plan was extensive. Yeah. And she and her husband, who her husband was a great player for us at BYU, you know, you, you go home at night. I don't think in that household they're watching TV. I think they're drawing X's and O's. Yeah. And we had the whole clan the We had the whole clan in here the twice. The family was here. And, and, and we're like, oh, wow, that, that is a very competitive family. And Amari's right there with she us. She just wants the yeah. ball. That's what Amari yeah, wants. And, and I, I think with Amber, like, I, when I say the heart, in this time of these young men and young women, the most important aspect of coaching is not necessarily the X's and O's and the strategy, though they are important. They're on that list. But you have to connect. You have to connect with these young men and women. This is their era. Yeah. They do things their way. I'm going to tell you a real quick story. Right. A dear friend of mine uh, you know, that I know, he's a, a generation specialist, Dr. Tim Elmore. And he w- played high school football at the same time. I didn't know him in high school, but same time in L.A. So we're same era. And he, we were talking about this, genera- this generation. And he said, Tom, I'm going to tell you something. This generation is different. When you and I were playing, we would, quote, run through a wall for our coach. These kids ain't going to run through a wall for their coach right now. Here's what they want to do. They want to run up to the wall together with the coach and together figure out a way how to break it down. And I went, oh my gosh, that's, that's exactly how it is. They want to be involved. They want to be part of it. They don't want to be told what to do. It's not my way or the highway. And so I, in Amber, I could see her, like her, her feelings and emotions and love for the student athletes. Now, she's hard. Yo, on she, she's she, hard she, on that she, team. She is grinds and but works. She, she earns their respect and love to where they, can, they have the possibility to connect. Yeah. Every day. You do this day in, day out. It can't be that you bring them roses one day and then bury them the next. You have to connect every single day. And that's what I see in her. Yeah, we, we well feel they're, they're going to be, when we talk to, to Amber, she says, we're going to be young, but we're going to be talented. Yeah, and so and she says, watch us play. We're going to have some fun. I, and I love that mentality. Hey, and, and when this young team gets a year under her belt, under, and, and yeah. maybe two years, they're going to be contenders. Yep, absolutely. And it's going to be fun to watch. Tom Homo is with us on The Wise Guys, the number one BYU sports live stream talk show in the world, as evident in our live stream tonight. We're live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and YSGuys.com. Soccer season opener Thursday night against St. Louis, 7 o'clock Mountain Time on ESPN+. Plus. Now, here's a coach who's the only coach. That's we, we, ever been at women's soccer, Jen Rockwood. She just wins. We had, we've had Jen on twice also, <laughs> by the way, here in studio with us. What, 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 when, you, when you look at what she's built, and, and now she's going in as the favorite to win in the Big 12, that says something. You know, I, 
I think some of the things I'm talking about tonight, and when I say that each program is similar in many regards, but different, unique, depending on the coach and the culture. But I think with Jen, because she's done this for so long, and she has been so successful at it, she doesn't change much, yeah. but she changes enough. And there was time where she changed some coaches, yeah. and these coaches each brought in a little new wrinkle. It didn't change the team at all, but changed a little bit of the strategy, a little bit of the connection was a little bit better. And the way that she has created the, her, the, the secret sauce for them is that summer, tr summer camp, the kids' camp. Yes. She does seven weeks of camp. I can go to camp and watch some of the kids, and they're like, 10, 11, 12, and she'll go, this one's going to be playing for me. I said, Jen, <laughs> they're 11. She goes, I know how to tell. And most every single girl on our team has played in our camp. Come to the camp wow. yeah. over and over again, right? Well, yeah, so she, it's like, it's not like she, she'll go all across the country to find kids, but a lot of them are in our own backyard, and she's not afraid to take the local kids that are very, very good. Hey, Glenn uh, is saying good morning from the Philippines. So we're Yeah, there we the go. Philippines, Philippines in the house tonight. We How love about it. That? We Hey, thanks for being with us. Because that's like, what is it 10 in the morning there? 11 Sometime morning? tomorrow, yeah. It's fantastic. Thanks hey, tell for, us who won for, the games tonight so th we, yeah. you know, we know you, in advance. Thanks, thanks for being with us. <laughs> when we had Jen in the first time, we talked about transitioning to Big 12. One of my favorite things was her confidence. And she brings that swagger to her team because she said, listen, um, we're not afraid to play against anybody. And we have some adjustments to make because we haven't played these teams a bunch. It's a really good league. We were in a good league with Santa Clara yeah, and with Portland. And she said, our expectations are this. We're going to put together a talented team, and we want to compete for conference championships and national championships every year. So this will be no different. And I was like, whoo I like that. Well, one, of, one of the things, the proof in the pudding for Jen is she generally has one of the toughest non-conference uh, yes. schedules in the country. So like this last week, they played, uh, you talk about traveling across the country. Right. They played an exhibition game against Rutgers yeah. in New Jersey. And they were in the national championship game last year. We beat them one nothing in a... You know, in an exhibition, right? But like, she will always have that team ready to play. We we don't get blown out of games. We might, you know, soccer's a tough game. The ball bounces funny ways, but they're very, very well prepared. She knows the talent that she has. She knows how to. That's one of the miracles of great coaches is they know how to use their talent perfect perfectly instead of just playing like the same way all the time. She'll take her talent and adjust it to take advantage of that individual's talent. Yeah. And the, the students have also figured out how to make Southfield oh, a man. horrible place it's to play for opponents. It's one of the best home environments in place all of play. soccer. For an opponent, you don't want to come to Southfield, yeah. and the Big 12 is going to see that coming. Um, but that, that's been a vision that has took some time to catch, and once the Cougar Nation caught it, especially the student body, they're all in all the time over there. Yeah, um, Jen, and her staff, Jen and her team have created this incredible event it's yeah. it's a, an experience yeah it really and is and they've led the nation in attendance for division one soccer f you know, i don't it's not fbs division one soccer Division yeah. Soccer, yeah. and and that's a, year after year we're in we're one two or three every yeah. single year so i looked at the stat a tcu led the big 12 in attendance last year and byu had three times the number on average wait glenn's up in the mountains of mindanao Roasting a pig for his daughter's birthday today in the Philippines while he's listening to the show. Hey, thinking about that, I want to know: Are, are is, is Amber watching the show from Italy tonight? I don't she know. She's not. Nah, but you know what? She'll they, listen. She'll listen to the they, podcast. They uh, they she'll stay pretty to the in podcast. tune. <laughs> and Trent listens to it all the time. So hey, let's talk about track and field for a minute because th this has also been a tremendously successful program on a national level, uh, both on the men's and the women's side. Um, the the world championships coming up in Budapest, Hungary. Um, uh, from August 19th through 27th, Kenneth Rooks, NCAA and USA champion, is going to play. we got Henry Marsh coming on next week Next week to talk about that. Oh, Henry's a great one. Because nobody's been, be nobody's right been like He's Henry until now, yeah. right? And Henry's like talked all about how Kenneth's got this great potential. Henry's coming in with us next week. we got former Cougar Zach McWhorter in the pole vault uh, in the World Championships, former Cougar Courtney Wayman in the steeplechase, um, representing in the World Championships. But this has been a program... Uh, that's been national in in uh, in its uh, ability, and they should go right in and compete in the Big Twelve right now, right? I think so. This is the, the thing about track and field 
It's a little bit different. Cross country, we're very, very good at. But in track and field, a lot of the teams now are not so strong winning, going for like a national championship team award. But like we have gotten super strong in the individual. Now you get enough individuals, you put them together. I mean, the teams that win national championships, you, they'll have four or five winners and you're going to win the championship that way. But you're seeing more at BYU where instead of spreading it out so much, they're trying to win a, a lot of national championships or have um, get people that are going to score high in the, in the national meet. Yeah, and, and related is, is, is our cross-country programs, both men's and women's, and they're elite, elite in cross-country. Yeah. I mean, that one of my favorite experiences as AD was going to uh, Tallahassee for the national championship a couple of years ago. We didn't win either one, but we won both individual races. Yeah. And to just see all these people, all the cross-country aficionados, and you're taking these pictures as the AD with my two champs. Two national champs. And people champs. are looking at that and go, how does BYU have the two champs? How is that possible? <laughs> You better figure yeah. it out. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, no, we hope they don't figure it out. Of, right? all, the, of all the great things that you've seen uh, in your time at BYU and associated with BYU, you had, you had the McMahon bomb, you had Danny Ainge beat Notre Dame, you had Jimmer Mania, um, Tina Gunn doing what she did, and, and, and right through Heisman Trophy and all that stuff, to see Kansas of Works fall down, get up, Un- and catch the field and win the national championship. Have you ever seen anything like that? It was crazy. Crazy. And I, have you had Kenneth on? No, no but we're going to get him when he comes back. We, we, he did that, and then he's just been nonstop. So we, yeah. we, we're, we're trying to get him, and when he comes back from Worlds, we'll get him on the show. Oh, and by the way, he's a 3.96 or 9.8 yeah. GPA. Brilliant. Yeah. So this kid... I mean, I say kid. He's a man. He's in the championships. He's in the world championships. But um, he's just like the most unassuming young man. Very, you know, respectful, conversational. But you'll think he's 33 years old. And and an accountant of uh, some sort. I'm telling you. But it's just like he, how many times, even if you have a plan, when it goes wrong in life, you got to figure out how to recover. You know, you get up on a knee, take a breath, look around. You got to make adjustments. You got to change. You get back on the track. He did that simultaneously. Like, like bam. Boom, 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 boom. And then just all the way, instead of trying to catch them all at the right. same time, he took his time. He, someone, I heard a story from Ed that he had planned out, if he fell, what he would do. Oh, my goodness. And that's, he did exactly he what did. he was supposed to do. I mean, the announcers, when you listen to the call of that, yeah. the announcer's like, and Kenneth Brooks is coming around. Like they, they, they didn't were, even know he was catching They couldn't up. even believe it. Like no. the way that they're like, this is unbelievable. We've never seen anything like this. It's it's one of the greatest feats I've, I've seen. Because this isn't, he's not running in a dual meet against the Sisters of the Poor. No, he's, no, no, no. He's running with the best athletes. The national team. In the national country. Athletes. Professional. Right? Yeah. And he gets up and wins that thing. Yeah. It, was, it was remarkable. Henry it was Marsh, so fun. I wrote a story with Henry Marsh for the Desert News right after. And he believes that, that Kenneth has a shot to finish in the top 10 over in Budapest, which he said would be incredible. Yeah. Uh, and then he made a comment, which he, he actually got faster like six years after BYU, Henry Marsh. So he's saying, hey, Kenna's future is just straight oh, ahead yeah, of him. Yeah. This isn't his peak speed. Mm-hmm. Um, may, 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 we may have a world champion on our, on and our like you and said, another Olympian. You, you got Courtney on the women's side. Yes. Yeah. You know, we might not be running back you, but we We're steeplechasing you, baby. Steeplechase you. <laughs> we had Courtney on the show last summer, right as we started this show, right after she won. And um, this, this, I, I go back to what you said earlier. Um, there's some, just some phenomenal young men oh, and young God. women. Yeah. And they're all we, over we campus. Had her, we had there's her and here a- just Ashton Lunton on the same show because Ashton had just yeah. won the national yeah, championship yeah, yeah. In, in the JAV. And we, we marvel every time we bring on the athletes at how articulate they are, how kind they are, how generous, generous they are. Like, you know, we, we're all spoiled that we get to deal with this group of athletes. Hey, who has the best job in the world? We do, because we, we have no responsibility. I do, yeah, I do. <laughs> because I get to rub shoulders with no. those young men. Just yeah. what you said. Every yeah. single day yeah. no. of my career, of my year, is spent with Cougs. Yeah, we always we always tease. We always tease. Dave and I have the best job in the world. We get to be around all these kids all the time. All these great coaches, and we have no responsibility to win. Yeah, but we've never lost a broadcast yet. Not one. We're undefeated. You've you've tied a few. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think one of the greatest things though is I get to see them 
in their struggles. My yeah. favorite event of the year is the graduation banquet where I go up there and I look at them and here's all the seniors and I'm thinking, we're in trouble. Yeah. All the captains, all the leaders, yeah. mm -hmm. all the all Americans are gone. What are we going to do? And then I look at all of them and realize every one of them has struggled mightily to be great. Yeah. And that's the, that's the formula. Let's uh, let's finish up uh, with women's volleyball and then we'll 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 uh, pitch what's going down tomorrow. And then we got a couple of quick questions for you. But the, the new polls out, the first one of the year for the AVCA top 25. Texas is number one, the, the defending national champ. BYU is number 17. The Cougars are picked number two in the Big 12, right behind Texas. Sadly, we got to go to Texas because it would have been fun to have them mm -hmm. at the field oh, that, house. That's an experience that people are going to love. But they're opening, up, they're opening up next week in Montana against fifth-ranked Pittsburgh. There's another program that likes to play teams. Pittsburgh is very good. I think we've lost to them three times in a row, but they've been very good games, very good matches. Never in Montana. No, not in Montana. They've been over there in Pittsburgh. Well, I think one of them was here in Provo, but yeah. um, I, I might sneak out to that one. Yeah, and, and you, you found that, that stat. Heather Olmstead's never been ranked to start a season lower than 18th yeah. in her nine seasons. Yeah. So great respect yeah, for that Yeah, Jared Jordan posted that, and so she comes in today at number 17. How about so the that? streak yeah. continues. The streak is on. So that's great stuff. Hey, the, the Cougar kickoff. Do we have the graphic for that, DJ? We can put that up. Cougar kickoff um, is tomorrow. You know, we had the Big 12 kickoff that we we did a live show from. Um, th this will be similar to that, but it, it's it's the fall sports kickoff tomorrow, Wednesday, August 16th. It's, it's free. It's from 6 until 8 p.m. on the football practice fields just north of that, that student-athlete building. Um, all the fall sports will be represented. Student-athletes are there. Um, giveaways, food trucks, performances, all kinds of fun stuff. If, if, you're just, if you're just in the mood to do what we get to do all the time, that's rub shoulders with some of these athletes and some of the coaches, this is a great thing to be at. It's, at, it's sponsored by doTERRA. Um, it's a great fan event. We'd encourage you to come. And, and you'll be there shaking hands and kissing babies, right? I will do that. Cosmo will be there. Uh, there'll be a lot of the team will be there. It's just like, it's kind of like one of the first, uh, one of the last events that we have where I say, okay, we're here. It's now. on now. Yeah, right. Here it's we on. go. It. <laughs> It'll be fun tomorrow. Weather's supposed to be decent, which will be, which will be good. All right. Every, um, by the way, uh, and we've, we've kept you long tonight, probably longer than you thought, but we sure appreciate your time here with us. Uh, Kyle Van Noy is the only interview that's gone longer. I want you to know of all the hundred and whatever that we've but had. Once we got you here, we were going to just hold you captive. Kyle, because Kyle, we, we Cougar Nation lo loves to hear from you. And, and we don't, there's not very many things we get to do, any of us, when we're working in television and you as an AD, where we get to sit down and just talk for this long and cover multiple topics and get into it and because everything is six minute sound bites. So we really appreciate you coming and doing That's this. That's what us. we used to do in the Wilkinson Center back in the day. Yes, we did. A little little uh, Why Sparkle and yep. Cheeseburger. You could sit, just there sit all and night. visit all night. So, <laughs> oh, well, by the way, uh, for on our night we had Kyle, uh, Marissa had the kids upstairs. And so he's like, I'll sit here and talk to you yeah, guys. All that. So, <laughs> it's all good. He said. I get that. <laughs> all right, five quick questions. We hit uh, every guest that comes on the show with this. Uh, it kind of reveals a lot. They're rapid fire. You don't need to think too much. But but we expect it to be true and sincere. Yes. And th first thing, the hits your head. So favorite sports movie? Um, Pride of the Yankees. Oh, Pride of the Yankees. That's the, he's the first one to say that one. Yeah. Pride, so. What year was that? Oh, it's Gary Cooper, okay. black and white. Yeah. The Lou Gehrig story. The Lou Gehrig Gehrig's. story. Yeah. Amazing. Perfect. You know, nobody, I, that just reminds me, Brian's song. Nobody said Brian's song. Yeah, that one gets over. Everybody overlooked. says, "Remember the Titans." We all rooting. cried through that. Yeah, except for Marie Osmond when she came on, she chose Hoosiers. Yes, she went that's, right that's Hoosiers. Because yeah. well, you ones. know she's married to Steve. She had to go yeah, basketball okay, to make okay, him happy. Okay. So, okay, favorite singer or band? Beatles. Beatles. Not Huey Lewis in the news. Well, I, I, I haven't been to a Beatles concert. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm old, but I'm not that old. Okay. Okay, I get it. <laughs> favorite breakfast cereal. Come on now. I'm not a cereal guy. I'm, I'm really, okay, I'm going to say Captain Crunch. All right. That's there's Dave's. No, there's no, there uh, there's I'm not no a cereal crime guy. In there. I've give, given up cereal a long time ago. Yeah, I don't, I don't do it now. But guess what? what Before was it a personal? Came up, no, no, so no. We had, I'm, we, I'm, I drink a little smoothie every morning. So yeah, I gotta, that's, I that's me now, my, too. I got to wash my, but. So I have to say, before I came up, I was starving and I was running late coming back from work. <laughs> so I look in the cupboard, and we had our two-year-old grandson with us the first part of the week because Kellen and the kids are down at Lake Power. Like, like you're not taking the two-year-old. <laughs> 
So Brenda had peanut butter Captain Crunch in the ooh, and I actually ooh. had a bowl of peanut butter Captain Crunch. That can do it. That it was so it. good. Okay, so Captain Crunch, I respect that. Favorite ice cream? Coconut. Anything coconut. Coconut ice cream. Yeah, handles at the mall. Coconut, coconut, coconut joy. Do you like do you like coconut ice cream or coconut gelato? Co- ice cream. I like ice cream. Rich, coconut like joy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's the um, first two, by the favorite way. Favorite advice ever given by your wife Lori? My wife is incredible. Tell the truth. I'm going to say this is favorite advice ever. So there was one time we were was Super Bowl tickets, and I gave some tickets to somebody that needed the tickets, and I didn't tell my wife. And so she goes, where did those tickets go? I'm like, I'm not sure. Oh. And she said, tell the truth. <laughs> I think so now anytime she thinks that I'm like a little white liar so she's like tell the, tell truth. the truth so that's my favorite advice yes. Words just, to hey, live by. tell the just truth tell the truth and I, I, I'm pretty truth, truthful yes I what, would say that I've what, known you a lot of years I would say that I know you'll get emotional here we have a bonus question for you in a second but what what has it been like to have her sitting at nearly every single sporting event that yeah. you've been at over all these years I could not possibly do this job without having a wife that considers date night being at an Olympic sporting event. You know, so like I, she knows how important it is for me, not just to to know the kids, but I got to see them play. I got to see with my eyes and feel with my heart how they play so I can see them and talk to them and talk about the games. And, you know, she's a sport. She knows that I love that. You know, and she has her favorite things that, like, people see me at vintage antique places a lot, <laughs> and I'm doing, I'm paying back. Sure you are. In a small, small way, all the many, many times where she's been with me doing my thing with the kooks. Yeah, that's great. That's so, great. So we, ha- we have a bonus question for you, because you've got a unique story. Um, so you became a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints six years after you left BYU. So when we met we, uh, back when I was first here and you were finishing up, um, you were not a member of the church, but we all thought you should have been. I don't know what was going on at that point. We all believe that. Um, what was the turning point in that process for you? I, I just think it was a matter of my, my walking that path. I wanted to do it on my terms. There was a lot of people that were pushing, and you know, it was a little bit. But I had to know deep in my heart that it was true for my, on my terms. And I knew that if I, if I jumped the gun, it wouldn't be true to my heart. But I knew that if I, I knew I was going to get there and when I did, it would all be worthwhile. So that journey for me was super important to me. And when I finally did, I, it's, a, it's a great story. It's a great story to me. I can't tell it right now. But as soon as I did, I never looked back. It's just like, it was exactly how I planned. I studied, I read all the books of the apostles. Um, Elder Maxwell was my favorite. I read every one of his books privately. I didn't want anybody to know. You were just doing it on your own. I just needed to know for myself. Mm -hmm. And in the end, um, when that day came, and it was just like that one day, and I said, that's it, let's go. And I was up here on, we were, I was with the 49ers, it was off season in February, and I woke up one morning. I went in, talked to Floyd. Yeah, Brother Jay. Brother Jay. I said, hey, Brother Jay, I'm getting baptized. He goes, what are you talking about? I said, I'm getting baptized. You need to help me. How do we do this? And he said, oh, boy. Let's go. <laughs> Here we go. Called up the missionaries. And they said, oh, we can't be there. And he goes, doughhead. Yeah, remember he's called me <laughs> doughhead. <laughs> you get down here right now. Because I said, if I, don't get, if I don't get baptized Saturday, and it was Thursday. Right. If I don't get baptized Saturday, I'm not getting baptized. <laughs> so Saturday. You gave him two days at least, right? <laughs> Brother Jay, for people that don't know, yeah. Floyd Johnson was our equipment manager forever. Yeah. Right? He was there when Tom and I were there together and um he was the he was the uh unofficial and official for us. Oh for sure. Spiritual leader for sure. of yeah. the team. And he assigned us to speak at firesides and he, he was so many of us got great counsel from Brother Jay over the years and he, he would you talk about tell the truth. He would tell it like it is to you yeah. if he didn't think you were telling yeah. the lie. I'm glad that his name popped up tonight because when you talk to BYU football in those days, in Lavelle's days, he's a big part of our culture. Oh. And it just shows you how many people on a team 
can contribute to something great. And so true. Part. Yeah, Brother Jay. Amber from New York says, thanks, Tom, for spending the time to help us fans better understand what's going on at BYU and the Big 12. Appreciate you. And we appreciate you being here. Go Cougs. We'll let you Go get Cougs. out. Thanks so much, Tom. We appreciate it, brother. Love you guys. The great Tom Homo taking BYU into the Big 12. Uh, and, you know, next year when you come back, then we'll ask you how many more years you're going to do this. We're not even going to ask that yeah, tonight. We're, we're going to save you, that for next no, year. No, you would like it. we got too is, much going on. He's we're got all, some, we're off right now. He, <laughs> no, he's got some navigating to do the next couple of years. He, he's not going anywhere. He's here. It's all about the energy. That's right. That's right. Have That's fun. Right. When, when we're doing game day and the, the team's running out on the field and you're down on the field uh, for the Sam Houston game as BYU starts its first year as a P5 and as a member of the Big 12, that's, that's, there's a slice of that that's a personal tribute to you. It's my bliss. I mean, you say have fun, don't worry about it. You're going to do it. <laughs> so, well, we'll be there and we'll, we'll be bringing it to y'all. Tom, thanks for spending this much time with us. Yeah, it's golden, it. golden for us. So.